On this week in Enterprise Talk, we talk about Gen 2 Linux distro getting a lesson in using real-world passwords. Amazon's jumping in on the telemedicine race with their acquisition of PillPack. And Brian, Curtis, and I talk with a great guest, Tejas Rao from Accenture, to talk 5G and the impact on the industry. Twilight on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twy. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 298, recorded July 6, 2018. Accenture 5G deployments. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Slack. Slack is a collaboration hub for work that makes sure the right people in your team are always in the loop and key information is always at their fingertips. Learn more at slack.com. And by Moogsoft. Reduce IT alerts and tickets by up to 90% guaranteed. Visit moogsoft.com to learn more and sign up for a demo. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. I'm Luis Moresca. This is the show for the enterprise tech, the IT professional, and the geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host for today, but of course, I definitely don't want to guide you through the world of enterprise myself because I need some help from some tech juggernauts in the industry, starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin, senior editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, I think you're uh, coming from some new digs there now, aren't you? I am indeed. This is the new Swamp Studio, and um, it, there will be some changes over time, but this is it. And uh, let me tell you, it feels great to be here. And uh, thank you for being here. We're looking forward to uh, seeing what you guys do, what you do at your broadcasting studio there. Of course, we don't want to do this show without our tireless producer and our co-host in crime, Mr. Brian Chi, director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu. Chi, but you're uh, calling from home there today, it looks like. Yeah, I was waiting for the air conditioner um, repair guy to come, and wow, I cannot believe how dirty that split system was. So it's now clean, and amazing enough, because we clean the air conditioner, we get a $100 rebate from Hawaii Energy. Go team! <laughs> Fantastic. We'd always use some rebates and especially energy savings. Well, so glad you guys are here today. And of course, we have a great show. We're going to have some guests. We're going to talk about 5G networking and of course, talk a little bit about Amazon's play on telemedicine. But of course, of course, we can't do this show without jumping into this week's blips. So we talked about Google's AI appointment assistant numerous times already, even in the last episode we talked about it. And at the time, Google was saying that they were only being used for assisting customers to make appointments and reservations. Chibit and I both thought the tech was too far along to only be using just for that. And we may have been right for once. A recent report suggests that Google has already started experimenting with ways to use duplex and other roles such as operations and customer service. In other areas of the industry, Amazon last year already started selling a version of its voice assistant Alexa designed specifically for using responding to questions via phone and text. And most companies already outsource operations to work in other countries where they can pay smaller wages in order to keep the expenses related to customer service down and AI would likely cut those costs even more. Why has AI been unsuccessful customer service in the past? Well, because they're just bad at it. A 2015 survey conducted by The Conversation found that 90% of those questioned call in customer service hoping to speak with a human. About 85% 80 said that they would speed through the automated prompts in order to talk to a person directly. And then 10% reported being satisfied with automated systems. Google's duplex is a solution to the problem. Although it still claims only to be making their hair appointments for you, it soon will be the character who's trying to fix your bill for you on the other line. Oh, goody. Hey, here's a lesson from Gentoo. Use real passwords. On June 28th, a weak administrator password allowed an unknown attacker to gain access to the Gentoo Linux distribution's GitHub account and lock developers out. In the attack, the intruders also modified the content of Gentoo's repositories and added malicious code that, among other things, was apparently designed to wipe end-user content. Now, the attack prompted Gentoo to declare all of its code on GitHub compromised and resulted in its developers being unable to use GitHub for about five days. 
Now, Gentoo has since regained control of the Gentoo GitHub organization, reverted all bad code commits to a known good state, and corrected defaced content. We give Gentoo props for openness in all of this by fully disclosing, fully disclosing what it knew and did not know about the incident up front. The breach got considerable attention, and the community helped it very quickly. But this breach is another reminder of the well-documented risks of using weak, default, and easily guessable passwords. The takeaway here, like it is for many recent breaches, is to pick proper passwords. Well, the Wireless Broadband Alliance is backing Wi-Fi roaming to tackle the digital divide. Now, I don't know about you, but public Wi-Fi is really frustrating, cumbersome, and clunky. The handover between networks is not consistent, not seamless, and definitely not user-friendly. What hasn't been happening are standards or even cooperation between the payment systems for public Wi-Fi systems. Too often, I find myself just turning off my Wi-Fi just to prevent having to authenticate over and over again whenever I roam. What would truly be spectacular would be the ability to load credentials onto my phone or device and be able to seamlessly roam between hotspots. Diego Rodriguez, general manager of the Wireless Broadband Alliance, uh, recently discussed the work taking place to take Wi-Fi to the next level. Being a critical component of the connectivity ecosystem, public Wi-Fi has never seemed to meet expectations. Rodriguez hopes this is going to change in the future. Quote, Wi-Fi is a technology which has the potential to connect the unconnected and close the digital divide, according to Mr. Rodriguez. Trials have already be begun to take place in New York City, which has more than 15 public Wi-Fi networks around the city, and also in Barcelona, Spain this year during the Mobile World Congress. Rodriguez said in Barcelona, more than 20,000 people connected to the public Wi-Fi, through, though only signed in once. Hmm. Devices were automatically connected to Wi-Fi at the FIRA, or in downtown Barcelona, and at the airport. The user's experience was improved, and there are also benefits for the city as well. Now, here's hoping that my GoGo wireless account will someday allow me to roam all over the city and conserve my LTE data plan. So quantum computing continues to trend as engineers and scientists target ways to reduce its complexity and requirements. In fact, this weekend, Microsoft is holding a Q-sharp context. Now, hardware and requirements for quantum computing is pretty demanding. Most advanced processors can't be reprocessed or repurposed as quantum devices. That's because quantum information carries dubbed qubits, having to follow different rules laid out by quantum physics. There have been attempts to use photons that make light as qubits, but because it can carry information long distances, it's already compatible with existing silicone today. But triggering a quantum transistor with light is challenging because that would mean transistors and photons of light would have to interact with each other as well. Well, a breakthrough from researchers at the University of Maryland and James Clark School of Engineering have developed a new photonic chip that makes this possible. The photonic chip is made from a semiconductor that, with numerous holes looking like a honeycomb. Light entering the chip bounces around and gets trapped by the hole pattern, where it eventually a small crystal called a quantum dot sits. Similar to conventional computer memory, the dot stores information about photons as they enter the device. The dot can effectively tap into the memory to mediate photon interactions, meaning the actions of one photon can affect others that later arrive at the chip. With this new technology, one million of these new transistors can fit inside a single grain of salt. And it's also fast and able to process 10 billion photonic qubits every second. It definitely feels like the next generation of programmers will need to be ready for, to rustle some qubits rather than bits in the near future. Hey, ready for some good news? According to the World Economic Forum, it will only be 217 years until women achieve economic equality. According to the World Economic Forum, progress towards gender economic equality has shifted into reverse for the first time since their studies began in 2006. Researchers annually evaluate 144 countries on their progress towards equality across four categories, educational attainment, health and survival, economic participation and opportunity, and political empowerment. Now, progress has been strong for the first two sectors where countries on average have closed 95 and 96 percent of the gap. However, it's been comparatively weak for the latter two where the average gap closure is 58 
and 23%. There are a lot of reasons for the gaps, but among them is a lack of experience among female candidates for tech jobs and organizations' unwillingness to educate them. Experts suggest a dual approach to close the economic gender gap. At an educational level, they say, we need to rebalance degree specialization choices. At a workplace level, we need to avoid exacerbating the imbalance that already exists. One step forward, it's time for us to stop pretending that women aren't interested in computers and in things cyber and provide the tools that all employees need to build their skills and stay ahead. Uh, Kubernetes, one of my favorite topics, keeps improving. The latest and greatest, Kubernetes 1.11, will be out shortly. Kubernetes has become the cloud container orchestration program, and its developers aren't resting on their laurels. Kubernetes has continued to develop at a rapid rate less than three months after the last significant release. Kubernetes 1.10, Kubernetes 1.11 is on its way. Specifically, according to Stephen Augustus, a former core OS engineer and now Red Hat architect, with each release of Kubernetes, we see a continued effort in building extensible APIs. This latest release brings greater stability and enhancements to custom resource definitions, pod priority, and preemption enabled by default. The ability to use Core DNS as the DNS plugin for the cluster and more. We are especially thrilled with the additional work in this release to help developers build richer Kubernetes native applications, especially operators. This last is a method of packaging, deploying, and managing a Kubernetes application. Sounds like DevOps, if you ask me. Well, my opinion is that containers and microservices in general are the future and are also great for reducing the overall attack surface for hackers. Now, it's just the manageability trend needs to continue. And, you know, I could truly be happy with Kubernetes. So Concords were thought to be a relic of old technology when it closed its doors in 2013. They were expensive to run and travel on, and they were just darn right loud. But we heard about a startup called Boom Technology raising $85 million in funding recently by claiming it found ways to make supersonic travel more economical. But... The question remains, has the technology changed enough for them to be successful? Well, NASA may have an answer to that question. The agency has announced that it will publicly demonstrate its new technology that allows for supersonic aircrafts that do not produce sonic booms. Dubbed the X-Plane, or Low Flight Demonstrator, recently renamed X-59 Quest, is NASA's new experimental project. Is NASA serious about building these aircraft? You bet your buttons they are. NASA recently awarded Lockheed Martin a $247.5 million contract to build the highly anticipated aircraft. As tests continue to see how palatable the new technology is for normal residents, NASA is sure this could revolutionize domestic and commercial travel in the near future. Look out for those silent shockwaves coming soon. To an airway near you. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But of course, we first have to thank a sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Slack. Now, if you haven't used Slack before, it allows me to bring numerous groups together in order to just organize the way that we work. I've seen it used in IT and operations as well as engineering development groups come together. They use it just to create new channels, talk about customers, talk about issues, talk about alerts. Video and voice calling, a feature that really makes it useful, save time, go back and search through and gain historical context around the discussions, see what people are talking about, see what teams are talking about, see what topics are going on. So Slack brings that rich environment. It keeps people up to date with what's going on. Create a new channel for a new issue. Show all your alerts, your real-time updates in those channels. Get data from Jira, Salesforce, Zendesk, Google Drive, and more. Even hook up a webhook from your system and make it that collaboration hub. So Slack keeps teams together and ensures they're communicating efficiently and staying productive every step of the way. Imagine your sales team getting together on Slack. They could talk and chat about the latest products, keep themselves up to date. They can come back later if they weren't part of the original conversation, search through history and learn about those products and customers, stay up to date on customers and their issues. Having Slack, I can tell you there are some great features in there, especially Slack threads. You can start a little conversation on the side and you can actually continue that conversation. This way it doesn't interrupt the main conversation. Plus search is super simple. They make it so you can actually add search modifiers in there. 
People of every generation have found ways to use Slack and increase their productivity. There are tons of public communities out there. In fact, I joined DevChat and designers and UX workspaces to talk about different industry topics and things that are going on in the industry. It's, it's fun and it keeps me connected. And not only that, Slack has a strong app ecosystem. You want more functionality and integrations? Check out all the apps that are out there. 1,000 of them. You want to integrate your own system? Super easy. There's a developer community that's thriving out there. Hook up a webhook. Hook up your integration to your app. It also works anywhere. It has iOS, Android, Windows, Mac apps that sync seamlessly where you can just pick up where you left off. Over 200,000 developers right now are building and collaborating on Slack. Slack brings the collaboration back to enterprise as well. With Slack's enterprise grid, you can either literally light up your workspace and that can be linked together in shared channels and allowing people to take advantage of the entire graph of communications in your organization. Slack reduces your email streams, streamlines your communication, saves time, and increases your productivity. I can't say enough great things about Slack. With Slack, your team is better connected. Learn more at slack.com. That's slack.com. And we thank Slack for their support in This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, next up is the bites. And this today we have a pretty interesting bite because, you know, we, we probably heard about Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, Jane Dimon wanting to fix health care by unveiling a yet an unnamed health care company that gives their U.S. workers and families a better option on health care insurance. So the statement said from the new company, it will free it will be free from profit making incentives and constraints, but it'll essentially try to change the way health care works. Well, Amazon and Jeff Bezos is not stopping there. The retail giant is taking its price chopping and consumer friendly approach to prescription drugs as well. Just recently, they acquired a company called PillPack. PillPack is a startup that's regulatory approval to deliver medicines throughout the country, basically calling, tell, calling themselves telemedicine. Think about it. At Amazon scale, it will allow them to negotiate prices in a way that the drug industry has never seen before. Now, tackling drug prices is not going to be easy. So the, the eventual price and consumer pays for a treatment is influenced by the opaque system of drug makers as well as insurers, middlemen uh, like pharmacies. But with the combination of the new health care corporation and now this new pharmacy, Amazon may be laying out the foundation for disrupting the market. So, guys, I want to throw it over to you, starting with you, Chibert. Th this is interesting because it seems like. You know, Amazon is is basically taking a shot across the bow here. They're saying healthcare in this country is not doing well. We're going to make it better. We're going to start by doing it for just our companies, then we're going to move it on. Now we're going to go and target the health, the pharmacy or the telemedicine side of things, and say, hey, now we know this is going to this is a big bureaucracy, it's big issues. We're going to try to tackle it ourselves. Is 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 this going to work? Like, are they, are they going to be able to to do what they've done with Amazon and just retail with 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 pharmacy as well? I don't see why not. I actually took a really hard look at PillPack um, probably two, three years ago. And the whole idea is by centralizing it in one place, you're not paying for is you know, you're not paying for the uh, secure shipping, you're not paying for the warehousing at every single location. So say say for instance, I go to CVS. The cost of having the pharmacist plus the, the stocking plus the security and all this other stuff. Plus the regulatory issues means that CVS or Walgreens or whoever has to pay that for every single location. Now, if you have a large warehouse where you only have to you know, provide security for one single area, um, you only have to have pharmacists approving things so that they're, they're more desk workers rather than um, bottle fillers. You're also using a less expensive way of packaging. So those those bottles, you know, um, were well, those things are pretty expensive. They don't recycle well because they're they're not type one or type two plastic. Um, and you know, it was great. You know, in fact, I I took a look at PillPack originally because they were a Twit sponsor uh, way back when. And I thought, okay, let me take a look at it. And I thought. Gee, being able to have these little spools of prepackaged um, pills looks like a really great way, especially since I was traveling so much in those days. And I know Curtis goes and shoves his pills into little Ziplocs. Um, because these are going to be like foil or plastic-lined um, paper 
with your day and time and so forth printed on them, uh, it could go a very long way, especially to the geriatric crowd that, have I taken my pills today? I don't remember. You know, so it's got some really, really good things for the consumer. It's got a way of reducing the cost of prescription drugs because they're not having to duplicate the really expensive pieces at every single location. And a lot of people say, well, but you're going to mail them. It's like, yeah, but the U.S. mail is actually really, really secure. Um, Their uh, investigative arm actually has a better closure rate than a lot of other law enforcement groups. In fact, the U.S. Postal Service is secure enough that under you know certain controlled conditions, you're allowed to send classified material through the U.S. mail. So in my mind, those are real big objections that a lot of people have about pill packers in general as a generic term. And I like the idea. I like the idea that um, Amazon's buying power can make a really big difference because my prescription drug bill, even though all you know most of my pills are generic finally, I still have some that aren't. And I'd really like to have someone like Amazon be able to drive the price down of my non-generic um, items so that they're more affordable, especially as I start getting older and I'm getting ready to retire. Right, right, right. Well, you kind of brought this up a little bit. I'm going to throw it over to Courage because I think you brought up, hey, you already put your pills in in plastic bags. You already kind of separate them. Why not just deal with the generics, the the vacuum seal bags? But do you you think that this is also a crowded market? Because there's a ton of other telemedicine kind of organizations out there. There's Resolution RX, Simple Meds, PAC Plus. You know, is this is Amazon going to be able to make another enough disruption in the industry in order to kind of call it to stamp it the Amazon way? Is it going to be something that people are going to want more of? Well, I think that Amazon's key to success in this rests on one thing, and that is forming an alliance with at least one of the major insurers. Because I know that there are a couple of the insurers who have their own captive mail order pharmacies, and they have some some fairly substantial. Um, incentives for their customers to get their uh, pills, get their medications from the mail order pharmacy rather than from their local CVS. Now, as you point out, when I travel, I tend to package up my my medication into to little Ziploc bags. Um, with that said, I'm not completely sold on the idea of, of mail order. I like having a relationship with a local pharmacist because I uh, happen to be on a cocktail of things. And so if I, um, you know, if, if I have some, some, conject- some congestion and want to take a, a over-the-counter medication, I like having someone that I can go and ask, hey, will th- how will this respond with uh, my current medications? Uh, I like having someone who keeps an eye on my medication so that if uh, the different docs uh, prescribe things, they can, can say, hey, let me call your doc because this one thing Dr. A prescribed is going to interact with something that Dr. B has you on. Um, it's, it's a tricky thing. Uh, as Brian pointed out, this is, um, we're, we're down to a handful of huge uh, pharmaceutical companies in the country as it is, the Walgreens, the CVS. Um, having Amazon in that marketplace makes a certain amount of sense. But, this is one of those things that is largely sort of last mile regulated by the states rather than the federal government. And there are still a fair number of medications that you must get in person. Uh, a lot of the painkillers, uh, especially the, the really effective painkillers, fall into that category. I happen to have friends, so I know that there are uh, things like anti-seizure medications that fall under that category. And then there are just the medications that many people are on, especially today, um, like insulin, that have to be refrigerated um, until they're used. So it's complicated, but I agree with Brian. I think it's great that there is a large player getting in like this because that has the opportunity to drive the costs down. And once one player gets lowered costs, the others tend to ride those coattails. 
Right, right, right. So, Brian, I want to throw it back to you because I, I have an interesting question here. So, Amazon obviously has your retail habits. They might have your now they they're starting to t- target businesses on Amazon.com as well. So, doing your commercial purchases, they have all of your habits, what you enjoy buying, all of your data. They have all your data on AWS and you know all that stuff. Now, let's combine that with the data that you have on your prescriptions as well. Is this something that we have to be worried about? Do they just have too much now? <laughs> You know, this is one of those double-edged swords. I don't know. Um, you know, obviously, if someone has your prescription history, they also know what things you might be sensitive to. So if, you know, let, let's let's be super paranoid. If someone wants to do me harm, then if they knew that, say, I had a heart condition, they could go and try and tweak something. But then again, you know, someone could also just sit behind, you know, stand behind me at a crosswalk. And when the bus is coming, just shove me in, in the crosswalk. You know, you've seen that in a lot of movies, too. So I don't know. It, it's, it's a double-edged sword. I like the convenience. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, Amazon doesn't forget about little regulations like HIPAA privacy laws. You know, obviously, they're going to have to do something about having us renew that once a year, at the very least. Um, but, you know, it's pharmace- pharmaceuticals are a business that needs a radical change. Let's put it that way. Um, I have bought pharmaceuticals in other countries, and it just absolutely shocks me to my toes, the price differences. You know, I've I've actually taken a copy of my prescription into a pharmacy in let's the last one I did was Thailand. And the pharmacist there actually said, You don't need a prescription for any of these. And I just stood there with my mouth open, flapping around, no sound coming out. And that was just a huge change. And it's like, okay. And then he's you know, I I pulled out a hundred dollar, you know, bill getting ready to pay for it and the guy goes oh that's i don't have that much change and he goes and i asked him how much would it be and what would have normally cost me in the u.s say a hundred dollars to refill um in thailand it was under 10 so that tells me that the u.s pharmaceutical industry is doing something interesting because it was the exact same everything brand stamp on the pill even the color and size of the pill there was nothing different. So it tells me something could – there's room to change. Let's, let's put that. Room to change. Right, right, right. So I, wanted to, I actually want to get Curtis's uh, thoughts on this as well because I, I kind of think that you know, now that they have the retail habits, they have, now they have your pharmaceutical data, but then they can cross-reference that and start recommending things on the retail side for you as well. To say, hey, like, it looks like you take this medicine, so maybe you need this. Maybe you need that. But that's just kind of taking it on the consumer side. It can happen more on the commercial side, too, where now they can provide more information to manufacturers and so on about things that are going on. They can really monetize on this type of things. Is that something that you see happening? Um, Because there is no regulatory constraint around that. So I I think that my question would be, hey, can can Amazon do this? Can Amazon use this in the wrong way? Well, there's a piece of me that thinks that it's it's right charming that, that you think that it's not already happening. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I think that that it does happen because, I mean, look at look at what Walgreens or CVS or wh- whatever your particular pharmacy happens to know about you. Um, they they do that. Um, now, they are limited in how they can share that information because of, of our good friend HIPAA. Um in theory, uh, the way that Amazon has done this, they have purchased a pharmaceutical company. And I think for a lot of reasons, they would need for that pharmaceutical company to remain a separate entity. Uh, there are just some, some powerful regulatory reasons for that to happen. What we don't know yet is whether there would all of a sudden be, when, when you place your order with this pharmaceutical branch of Amazon, uh, a, a little checkbox in about four point type that says, hey, if you don't check this, we're going to assume it's okay 
for us to share your information. Because as you know, HIPAA basically says that the information is yours. You can share it as you wish. There's a lot going on here. And I think we already see a great deal of guessing and, and data synthesis happening with the companies that want to, to market things to us. Do I think this would happen more if Amazon does have the, the pharmacy? You betcha. Um, do I think that most Americans, certainly, given the way they deal with their privacy now, would be okay with this? Yeah, probably. Right, right, right. Well, we'll have to see if uh, if PillPack will be a disruptor uh, here in the industry for sure. Well, let's move on to the next one because the next one's interesting because it's trying to change a potential service that's been around for a while. We 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 talk about SMS and MMS in the past. Now, SMS is a very simple protocol that you guys have used probably in the past. You know, sending text messages across. Uh, it's a very simple simple protocol. It doesn't allow you to do things like read messages or read receipts and other things. But with the likes of Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp and WeChat, adding all these additional features in there, it tends to make look MS SMS kind of lost in the background. Well, that's where this new rich communications service protocol comes in. It's the industry is trying to replace SMS with RCS. Now, RCS is interesting because it's uh, essentially brought in to uh, make a better type of an evolution of SMS, essentially. It adds features in there for like rich messaging content, uh, integrated features like read receipt directly. Um, just like, you know, in fact, just like video and audio messaging that they had in some of these other devices and other applications. Now, I, I want to throw it over to you guys because I think that let's start with cheaper because I think that SMS obviously is one of those things like, for instance, an, a cell phone service will tell you, hey, you know, in a, in a crisis, don't use your cell phone, send a message because it's a small packet of information, kilobytes, maybe and sometimes you know, depending on the size, you only get 160 characters there. It can get it over the wire much easier than making a phone call, much easier than using the Internet and using these messenger services. Is, is RCS going to change that? I mean, it sounds like they're offering more capabilities. It sounds like it's similar to just using an Internet connection, but are there small packets of information that they're compressing? Is this going to cause more issues than it is actually going to fix them? What do you think, Juber? Uh, yeah, I think so. You know, I actually use SMS a lot. You know, you you can encode data and send an awful lot of useful data in an SMS message. Also, like you said, SMS can get through when voice or data can't. In fact, you know, it's it's the communications method of choice in emergencies. Um very cool. No, I, I put my spin on this is cell carriers want you to buy data. They make a lot of money on data. They don't make as much money on cell calls. They don't make as much money on SMS because that's on the cellular side. Their profits come from the data side. RCS is a data only um, technology. It is basically responding to the market where they want, you know, the Snapchat and, you know, that generation being able to send, you know, multimedia messages to each other. So they're responding to a marketplace. Now, will SMS disappear, which I think is what you're alluding to is I don't think so. I think it's still important. I think there's still a lot of machine to machine um data that's sent over SMS. I certainly use it. Um, it. In fact, I can't afford full data on the um, Iridium side, but I can afford it on the SMS side. So I think that's going to be one of the things that's going to make a change. It's going to be the machine-to-machine -machine side that's going to keep breathing life into SMS, but I think it's the millennial Snapchat generation is going to be driving RCS as a marketing tool. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, in fact, Emily Strange in the chat room saying, hey, I enjoy my Facebook Messenger, Messenger. don't try to get rid of it. But I think it, it, it kind of it, it's changing a protocol. It's changing the definitive default that carriers provide as a messaging protocol. So this is interesting. I want to throw it over to Curtis because I want to know how how is this going to change in the enterprise? Because once you change the default protocol that things are going on, you could essentially build upon that cr- protocol and maybe even create new industry there. Uh, is this something that you think will you know help? the enterprise in some way, because again, they, they require some of these data streams, this information, especially with IOT devices out there today. Um, other things that just need a very definitive data protocol, uh, data related protocols rather than streaming data over the internet or so on. Plus sometimes data connections in the industry are not always the most prominent. You think this will help with that? Um, you know, being able to send just pure data across the wire. Well, on the one hand, it certainly could. On the other hand, I think one of the virtues of most IoT devices is that they are pretty skinny from a, a data transmission point of view. And I think a lot of both the manufacturers and the carriers like that because the last thing we, we really want is billions and billions of autonomous devices out there just spewing data willy-nilly. Uh, that's a recipe for raising cell deployment costs. So I think that they're gonna, there's going to be a push to keep industrial stuff and, say, wearables and all of that down at the SMS level because it's, it's in place and it's cheap. What I think we have here is something that could very well be used for richer richer messaging, uh, richer, if you will, asynchronous messaging. Um, What I fear is that this feels a little bit like a step back to the, the, the days of email in the 80s when different systems had different different features and different functions. I mean, if you were on CompuServe versus MCI Mail versus you know, the well versus prodigy versus whatever. Now, there were were standards that came into place, protocols that came into place that allowed you to send a, a an email message from one system to another, but you couldn't do it with full features because there were system-specific features. And that's what this feels a bit like, uh, sort of the Android version of, um, uh, of Apple's, messages. Uh, and that that's fine. But I worry about us once again, getting into this somewhat balkanized state. Uh, and that's something that most enterprises hate. I mean, they, they, they hate on the one hand, supporting multiple uh, platforms at all. But when you all of a sudden get multiple platforms with multiple rich feature sets, uh, it starts being a real nightmare when it comes to to figuring out which apps you can support, which messaging protocols, all that. So I have a feeling that there are a lot of enterprise people who are looking at this with a lot of skepticism and a lot of worry because what they see is a great deal of integration work coming down the line and they can be only exci- so excited about that. Right, right, right. Well, hopefully it doesn't bring us back to the email of the 80s, but I think it definitely will cause issues and be disruptor in the enterprise. We'll see what happens as RCS has kind of moved along. Well, folks, that does it for the bites. And next up, we get to bring a guest in to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. But first, of course, we have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And of course, that's Moogsoft. Now, as an engineer over the last decade, as being a service engineer in cloud services, I can tell you right now that you know, incident tickets tend to be on the rise from the same alert coming in, whether it's a Sev zero or Sev eight ticket. It's a huge time waster. The operations team will create a ticket for engineering, and then another engineering team will create another ticket. Maybe even customers will call in to support and to create another ticket. All these different alerts coming along, it's really hard to cause and dedupe these things. Well, guess who suffers? Your customers do. And that's where the main advantages of MoogSoft AI Ops comes into play. It's artificial intelligence for IT operations. They have this patented noise reduction technology as well as automatic deduplication and alert ranking. There's no rules and filters. They manage the floods of alerts for you. They can literally reduce your alerts by up to 90%. Once the alert is managed, they also surface 
actionable work items for you. Their clustering technology actually correlates it into what they call situations. So you can better view the issue without having to look into the alerts and all those tickets that are coming in as well. Mooksoft does this because it looks at patterns in order to provide root cause for any incoming situation. It can even reuse tribal knowledge automatically to help resolve issues quickly by using supervised machine learning. Not only that, it integrates with just about everything. Splunk, Oracle OEM, AWS Cloud, Azure Tools, and more. And it's extensible, which means you can easily integrate your system into it because it uses standard mechanisms like REST API, webhooks, SMP, and more. Just plug your data streams into it and get it working for you. Mooksoft is really the one-stop shop for IT and dev organizations because it literally manages and routes the fire hose of alerts to make it more manageable for your organization. This type of system is really a gift if you think about it. It makes it so small or large organizations can scale their service and their IT business. It makes it so you can achieve full visibility across your entire technology stack without any blind spots. Now, not that you needed more proof, but you may have heard of the global IT managed service provider, HCL Technologies. They included Mooksoft AI Ops in their award-winning dry ice platform within their event management layer. Not only does this help organizations reduce the ops workflow, but it also helps reduce detect to correct time. How well does Mooksoft work for HCL? Well, it actually helped them reduce their mean time to restore by 33%. What does that mean? Well, it means that they can support more customers with high service quality, all the while also keeping their operation costs low and their efficiency high. I don't know about you, but if you're an organization with a service or even an app today, you're going to want Mooksoft to scale your business. With Mooksoft AI Ops, you can reduce your IT alerts and tickets by up to 90% guaranteed. Visit Mooksoft.com to get a demo. That's Mooksoft.com. And we thank Mooksoft with their support and this week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, now it's time to jump into my favorite part of the show. We get to bring in a guest to the Twilight Riot and drop some knowledge on us. And our guest today is Tejas Rao. He is the Managing Director and Global 5G Offering Lead from Accenture. Tejas, welcome to the show today. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, before we get into the nitty gritty of 5G, because I definitely want to talk about how this is going to be a disruptor. Can you tell the folks at home, just give them a quick journey through how you got started in tech, who you are, you know, what kinds of things you've been focusing on? Yeah. Um, you know, I've been in the business and with Accenture for the last 15 years, started my career both in kind of IT, building up backend uh, BSS OSS systems and moving on to looking at devices. So I spent a bit of time with Nokia launching their device business. And then now I've been focused really on kind of the next generation of wireless technology and helping develop our offering around 5G and how we can get these networks deployed very quickly. Fantastic. Okay, well, first we want to get into this mythical thing they call 5G, I always see. What, what is it, what is it, can you just tell the folks, what does the superpowers of 5G have over the 4G? Well, I mean, it comes down to kind of three basic fundamental areas, right? So, and then we've, we've all kind of been used to the 4G network with our mobile devices. You know, 5G is really a next generational step up in, in the network. And by that, I mean that it's going to evolve around three dimensions. One, around massive machine type of communications. You know, we've got, you know, we talked about IoT devices being connected on 4G. What this allows you to do is actually connect, you know, over 100 times more devices onto the network. The second is really enhanced mobile broadband. So, you know, we're used to getting kind of internet services on our devices, but what if we could get you speeds of up to greater than 10 gigabytes at peak, or at least 100 meg uh, megabits per second anywhere on the network, right? So it's really about enhancing the, the overall capacity and speed of the network. But lastly, I think the big unique differentiator on 5G is going to be providing ultra-reliable low latency communication. So taking what typically the latency in a wireless network when you start communicating between a device and the network is around 50 milliseconds. What if we can drive that to less than a millisecond? Then you start to see the real-time nature of the, of the network, enabling things in the society as a technology, being able to connect to devices, businesses, changing. So that's kind of what 5G really brings is, you know, just more of everything, more of data, more devices, and just at super high speeds. Right. So I think you, you talked a little bit about the so there's ultra reliable, ultra low latency connectivity. How does this kind of change the landscape though? So we talk about installation. There's already 4G towers out there today. The networks already have them. Um, they have their service areas that they, you know, always they always advertise, hey, here's my service area. How will this change yeah. for 5G? What is it going to change for the carriers? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think, look, we, we've all seen carriers announcing their trials this year, starting to talk about certain cities lighting up next year. So, you know, I think from a from a carrier perspective, they're already starting to deploy and do field trials. They're, the, we see kind of the commercial launch of 5G really starting to take effect in 2020 and then progressing towards 2025. So typically, these generations of technologies take five, seven years to actually really deploy everywhere, right, as a, as a network. And so, you know, I think from, from, a, from a technology perspective, we'll see kind of 5G starting to shape in 2020, but really all of these kind of applications and services we're going to see are going to take shape in, in kind of the mid-2023, 2025. Right. And I think I think that, that go, brings it back to commercial. I mean, sorry, also residential uh, type things as well. So the, the, has to, the hardware has to support it as well. Is the hardware catching up where they can support these types of networks? I haven't seen any kind of normal um, consumer-based devices that support it. We have seen, I think, at the Olympics, they debuted the technology in a, a kind of a private network, but they nobody could really view it because of the because of the technology wasn't available yet. Is this something that's already there? Could it will it be you know brought to fruition once the network is there, or is it just something that we're waiting on? Yeah, I know. I think we need both of them to kind of come together very quickly, right? So, uh, I agree with you. I think we've started to see chipset manufacturers. So the one thing to kind of bring this technology to life and to bring it to market, you kind of need both the network to be there and then the devices to come as well, right? We've started to see chipset manufacturers, um, you know, uh, support the, the 5G modem. So that's going to happen around the 2019 timeframe. We've started to see mobile device manufacturers start to provide support for those chipsets. So from a timing perspective, all of this is kind of lining up and it's actually accelerated. So you know, I see 5G handsets kind of coming into the market in 2019, but the reality is it takes us a long time for us to kind of, one, deploy the network, but two, start to get the penetration on these devices. So, you know, globally, you know, I see this kind of 5G handset market starting to arrive in 2019, but by 2021, we're seeing still only about 10% of the smartphone handset market be 5G capable, right? So it'll take some time. Okay. By the way, is your name pronounced Tejas or Tejas? It's actually Tejas. Yeah. Tejas, thank you. I, I hate mispronouncing names. Anyway, no I want to pass on a question from our chat room. Uh, okay. Emily the Strange says, hey, can you pass on a question, Chibert? Will 5G support completely autonomous work? Because when 4G launched, it needed 3G for voice. Will 5G finally have complete complete data and voice standalone without any legacy network use? Yeah, so, you know, so 5G is going to be all about pure IP connectivity, right? So internet connectivity will still support all of the internet traffic that we're used to in terms of data, voice, video. So, yes, I mean, I think at the end of the day, 5G is going to enable cloud connectivity, virtualized uh, environments, and essentially what it does is actually provides you slices of the network, right? So if you're only an IoT device and you don't need pure uh, high-speed connectivity, there's a slice of the network for you. If you're going to be using video uh, communications and video services, the network can create a slice between the device and the network for you. And then as we talk about things like autonomous cars that require really real-time communication and high-speed connectivity, there's a slice and a set of devices that can communicate on it. So it's got uh, a tremendous amount of flexibility. It drives kind of the next generation of adoption related to software-defined networks, virtualization. And so, yeah, there's there's a ample amount of flexibility provided in the architecture for carriers to start to define a virtual slice of the network and provide services unique to the devices and the people that are trying to consume those services. Okay, so when, we, when we're talking about the... Uh in the bytes just before the um, commercial break. We're talking yeah. about RCS. I was saying I didn't think SMS was going to disappear anytime soon because of the MTM um, implications. But if 5G is completely data, then yeah. RCS actually makes a heck of a lot of sense. Am I going down the right road? I, I think you are. I think RCS makes a lot of sense in terms of rich communication and kind of the internet enabled. And as you were right when you said it's pure data. What we got to remember is SMS is native to wireless, right? And when you think about the device ecosystem and, and the device globally, I mean, SMS is a base standard that's been there since, you know, first and second generation of the network. So I don't think you'll get away from SMS. 
because you know ultimately what you're trying to do is connect as many devices as you can and the foundational pieces are still sms what we're trying to do is enable you know as we kind of talk about the rich communication and what can we do what can you possibly imagine that 5g can enable well you know with more data with more devices the interactive communication connectivity and the cloud connectivity and data storage starts to enable kind of net new innovation in my mind. So I think with RCS, you're just seeing kind of that that first step in innovation. What can we do with our communication platform that we couldn't do before, right? But I still think, you know, when I talked about it, there's 10% global penetration of smartphone by 2021. I think SMS will still be here for, for a while yet, right? Until we can get every single device to be 4G or 5G, you'll still have to depend on some of the um, the, the previous generation of technologies. Tejas, I want to, to ask a question about all of these devices connecting at high speed. Uh, one of the things that we've seen is that to this point, it's been difficult for someone to use, say, mobile devices uh, as an effective DDoS engine or, or even good spam engines because of the limited bandwidth that so many of them have. Now, with 5G, that limitation goes away. So do you see the carriers doing anything to, to help on the security side when we, we're going to have all of these more capable devices with much bigger pipes to the world? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you, look, 5G's, you know, we talked about the, the functional capabilities of enhancing the broadband as well as the, the number of devices, but there is a security layer that's being defined as part of the standards body. So it's going to have enhanced security. And so, you know, from a carrier perspective, you know, they're a trusted relationship with the consumer base. They're naturally going to make sure that, you know, the wireless network is going to be secure and that the transmissions and the encryption protocols are going to continue to, to evolve similar to kind of Internet technologies. Right. So I don't see uh, wireless being any different than trying to make sure that the Internet and the security protocols and the encryption protocols that are available get evolved and transported into the 5G world and the wireless world. So I want to take it quick, quickly into the the kind of the government regulation side of things. So we're seeing that the FCC and areas are, are giving um, you know carriers incentives to go in and reduce the amount of time it takes them to put these new uh, nodes in, these new antennas in for the 5G network because then they will hopefully uh, in turn add their antennas to areas which are low coverage areas like farm and rural areas. Is this something yep. that we're seeing is helping the industry move along to 5G or is it something that we're seeing that's hurting? Um, is, there, is there a little bit of controversy there? You know, where do you see the landscape being? No, I think, you know, I think all of these kind of regulations and taking another look at it is, is helpful to the industry, right? Because what, what I talked about was you know, typically these next generation technologies take five to seven years to deploy. What's fundamentally different about 5G is, so if you take the U.S. market, for example, right, there's probably 300,000 macro cell towers uh, to support the, the number of carriers that are in the marketplace. What 5G is different is that it's going to be able to deploy exponentially a larger number of small cells to provide capabilities in certain markets. And that, that capability could be very high speed network connectivity for real-time communication or enhanced mobile broadband. So take that 300,000 uh, macro cell towers and you want to try to deploy a million of these things, we're going to have to take a different approach as it comes to local communities about enabling these small cell uh, deployments. And so I think uh, taking a look at the regulations, looking at the permitting, looking at the fee structures, looking at how do we get right to way access are all going to be very helpful in accelerating the deployment of these networks. Because the carriers are making significant investments and the sooner we can get the technology deployed, the sooner the consumers and the enterprises can benefit from net new innovative solutions. Chat room's asking a question. I'm asking a question. Is 5G f and being all data, is that going to finally force everybody to go to V6, IPv6? Uh, you know, I think the IPv6 is a, a critical success point for 5G. And when we talked about it, remember what I said was the first thing it enables is billions of IoT devices, right? And what IPv6 does is gives you that scaled addressing capabilities to allow all these devices to connect. Number two, I think the IPv6 protocol also arouses for interoperable protocol communication. And so what we want 
5G to be able to do is provide not only the internet connectivity to these IoT devices, but the middleware and cloud computing capabilities to start exchanging messages rapidly between devices. So I see IPv6 as a huge enabler and, and, and a critical success factor for 5G. So how will, how will this change the industry for when it comes to devices? You talked a little bit about IoT, um, but will this affect, like for instance, autonomous vehicles, they need some, they potentially need uh, neural networks or a way to kind of connect to themselves and talk to each other. Um, a lot of IoT devices need a way to communicate to each other, have longer battery life, have continuous uh, connectivity. Is this is this something that we're going to see a disruption in the network in the industry because of the network change, or is it something? Hey, it's just kind of the start. We don't see what's next. Well, I think it's 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 the start, right? I mean, in terms of what's next, I mean, I think there's limitless possibilities once you kind of deploy the network, and it's really I look at five G as an innovation platform, and what. What can you do that's possible today with leveraging the technologies that are out there but enabled on mobile, right? Augmented reality, virtual reality, high-definition video, 360-degree video, tactile internet. I mean, there's an endless list of use cases and possibilities for 5G. And I think, you know, once we get the network deployed, we get the investments in the devices, you know, they're going to be purpose-built depending on the services they're trying to perform and, and the solutions they're trying to provide. So... You know, I think that there's there's use cases that we probably haven't even thought about that will get enabled once the, the network's deployed, right? So that's an innovation platform in my mind for 5G. Right, right, right. So kind of going back to you, like how how are you guys planning on using it from Accenture perspective? Is is there you know obviously you're kind of you're kind of spearheading this initiative? You know, what types of things are you looking to kind of build on and utilize in this type of network? Well, we're we're kind of taking our innovation architecture capabilities based on our uh, Liquid Studios, our design studios, our innovation centers, and looking at 5G as kind of the the platform to launch um, our consulting side of the business, as well as kind of the services we provide not only our clients, but this is an enabler for all industries. So we've got you know 400 over 400,000 people within Accenture. We're a mobile workforce. We're leveraging the, the, the mobile technologies to kind of do our own day-to-day work. But we're also looking to kind of see how we can accelerate the innovation and the uh, transformation that our clients need to do, both in the comms and media and high-tech industry, but also all of the other industries that can, can leverage kind of mobile technology, whether that be in utilities, financial industries, products, you name it, in transportation. So we see 5G as an enabler across uh, what we call Industry X.0 and in our digital practice, but also an enabler for our carrier clients to start to make the investments in the network, deploy them faster, and then start to kind of look at net new innovative services they can provide their their clients. Right. So you talked a little bit about timeline before. We talked about 2019 potentially being devices coming into play and then the network kind of evolving over time. You know, what types of what types of things do, does the network type um, have to go through uh, over the next couple of years in order to kind of field test to make sure it's ready for the industry? Um, what's kind of left over? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the, the timeline really is um, uh, looking at specific markets, specific cities, and then we see kind of the first um, 5G services clearly leveraging things like internet services and video and enhanced mobile broadband. Where it gets a little bit more complicated and more complex is as we talk about the densification of the network and deploying the the scales, kind of small cell towers that we talked about. I mean, the number that needs to be deployed to start to support the the third dimension of that of that 5G capability I talked about, which is the ultra reliable low latency. That's real-time communication connecting thousands of cell towers, small cell towers to be able to produce these services. So we see those kind of lagging um, and the first services being more video-driven or more IoT-driven in terms of connecting the, um, the devices. But you know, by 2023, 2025, you start to see these networks being densified. You'll start to see you know, some of these other solutions around autonomous cars or vehicle to vehicle communications or the tactile internet starting to take shape. So, you know, it's gonna be uh, an evolution uh, definitely around services and solutions, but it's, you know, it's coming soon. Right, right, right. Well, we're running close to low on time, but I wanted to leave it up to you to kind of maybe bring up a topic around 5G that you think the, the audience needs to hear. I know we talked a little bit about regulation, about the technology, about the reliability, about the network type. But there's anything else that the audience should know about 5G kind of going forward? 
you know, I think it's a uh, it, it the, the the timing of this is is kind of great because we start to see a lot of the new technologies being adopted both in the consumer space and in the enterprise space. Whether we're talking about artificial intelligence, we're talking about big data, we're talking about virtualized uh, virtualization, software defined networks, cloud. We we kind of look at 5G as as on the wireless side, taking advantage of all these net new technologies to deliver kind of the next generation of the innovation platform. So, you know, we're already very um, uh, consumer centric uh, uh, mobile device users that are always connected in the internet. I kind of think about 5G as being that connected consumer uh, moving to more of an augmented connected consumer, leveraging kind of this next generation of technology. So, you know, it's going to be exciting. It's, uh, there's a lot of possibilities for 5G and I'm, I can't wait for the innovation to kind of take place once the devices and the the, the, the network is going to be there and deployed. Fantastic. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat through another hour of the Best Day Enterprise show, according to 9 out of 10 5G Towers. We, of course, want to ta- thank Tejas for uh, for being here. Of course, we give you, want to give you a chance to say anything you want here. Can you t- tell the audience at home where they can find you, your work, a little bit about event, Accenture, and anything about 5G? Yeah, no, you can find uh, our 5G uh, capabilities on the Accenture website, so www.accenture.com. Uh, I, of course, am uh, based in Toronto, but uh, you can find me at tejas.rao at Accenture.com from an email address perspective. So looking forward to connecting. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here. Of course, I want to thank my panelists for dropping some knowledge on the Twyat Riot, starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin, Senior Writer at Dark Reading. Curtis Thank you for being here from your new digs. Can you tell the folks at home where they can find you and all of your work? Well, as always, you can find me at darkreading.com. I have some interesting stuff coming up in the next week. Please take a look. Uh, This week was, of course, short with the holiday dropped in the middle, but uh, looking forward to a full week next week and beginning to get ready for Black Hat and DEF CON. I've already got a lot of companies being in touch. I'm setting up my schedule to talk to folks out there. Looking forward to bringing some uh, black hat wisdom to the Twyat Riot from uh, out in the desert in about four weeks. So uh, if you've got any questions about the world of security, want me to ask folks out there, please let me know. Drop me a note on Twitter, KG4GWA. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to try to find a way to get the Black Hat this year. We'll have to see if I can finagle it. Of course, I want to thank my other co-host in crime, Chebert, our tireless producer. Chebert, can you tell the folks at home where they can find you and a sneak peek into what you're working on next? I am A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B, um, Advanced Net Lab at on Twitter, or I'm Chebert at twit.tv. And actually, I am working on M- an MQTT gateway because the Cayenne, we've had Cayenne on the show before. We want to have a nice, really easy to use um, dashboard that we can make modifications very, very quickly with low amounts of coding. So what I'm doing is we're creating the MQTT plugin for the Raspberry Pi so we can push data from unsupported sensors into this dashboard. And so basically what I'm doing is I'm trying to cut and paste sample Python code from Atlas Scientific so that we can measure the temperatures of liquid nitrogen doors and also ultra-low temperature fridges that go down into the neg 100 Celsius range so we can protect sensitive genetic material. Ought to be fun and interesting. Fantastic. Again, you always get all the fun stuff. I need to get uh, more into that type of thing as well. Of course, I want to thank you as well. You tune in each and every week. You are our loyal listeners. We couldn't do the show without you. And we want to make it easy for you to tune in each and every week. Go right now to twit.tv slash twiet. You can find all of our episodes and all of our back episodes as well as the guest information and links to our show notes. And importantly, next to the videos over there, there's that magic button to subscribe to the format of your choice, whether it's audio, video, HD video, and the device of your choice, phone, tablet, laptop, desktop. And after you subscribe, you might as well also remember, come check out the show live each and every week at 1.30 Pacific time at live.twit.tv. Come see how the pizza is made because, you know, it's always fun to see the, what's going on behind the scenes. And also, if you're going to be here live, you might as well jump in to the chat room live as well. You've, you've probably heard we pull some questions each week from the chat room. There's some great discussions going on there and it really helps the show move in different directions. So don't forget to do that 
and come say hi to us. Also, don't forget, you can follow me at twitter.com slash UMM, where you can find all the interesting things that I'm working on each and every week. Plus, you'll, you can learn about my daily work, a daily job at dev.office.com, where you can find all the latest and greatest ways to customize Office. Also, I want to thank the sh- thank everyone for the show who makes the show possible. Of course, we want to especially thank Leo and Lisa for supporting us each and every week on this week in enterprise tech. Of course, thank you to all the engineers as well as our talent producer Chebert there. Of course, I also want to thank our TD for today, Kevin. You got a camera on yourself there? No, I do not. I forgot oh, to do that. Sh- well, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna continue the tradition that Gbert had. I mean, that uh, Padre had when he was doing the show. Why don't I just ask you something simple? What was the main topic about today's show? Uh, 5G. No, sorry, it's it's about getting rid of 4G. But thank you so much for for, for playing this week <laughs> in Enterprise Techs. Uh, but you know, maybe next week we can get you again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but thanks for playing. Until next time, I'm Louis Moresca, and if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Twi-